I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility course. I'm continuing our discussion of conflicts of interest. And here we're talking about what does it mean when we talk about the lawyer having a material limitation or when we talk about material limitation conflicts. Let's dive in. When we talk about conflicts of interest under Model Rule 1.7, keep in mind that there are two general categories of conflicts. A previous video, I talked about directly adverse conflicts. Those are usually situations where you have two or more clients at the same time and helping one of them hurts the other or others. Material limitation conflicts, on the other hand, are situations where for some reason one person can influence your judgment about how to represent someone else or can incentivize you to make certain choices when representing the other person. Now, the person influencing your judgment could be another client, but it could also be a non-client, a third party maybe who's paying the legal fees for one of your clients. It could also be the lawyer's relatives or family members, or even yourself, your own personal hang-ups or financial interests. And the, the influence could either take the form of pressuring you to make certain decisions or maybe to not work as hard to achieve the client's objectives. Also keep in mind that some complex scenarios will fit into both of these categories because the clients are directly adverse and the lawyer has a material limitation because of their, um, they're more loyal to one than the other or they favor one over the other. But many complex situations will fit in one category or the other. Now, turning to comment eight to rule 1.7, it says, even where there is no directly adverse conflict of interest, there could be a significant risk that something will affect the, a lawyer's ability to consider, recommend, or carry out an appropriate course of action for the client. It gives an example. Let's say a lawyer is asked to represent several individuals who are seeking to form a joint venture. That lawyer is likely to be materially limited in his ability to recommend or advocate all possible positions that each might take. And that's because of the lawyer's duty of loyalty to the others. The conflict, in effect, forecloses alternatives that would otherwise be available to the client. In other words, ideally, each client, when they're forming a partnership or starting a new corporation or some other type of new enterprise, should have their own lawyer who really understands their interests and goals um, their risks and liabilities, and will be looking out for their interests specifically in drafting the documents and negotiating the terms. When one lawyer has to represent the whole group, they have to balance the interests of each one, which means each client isn't really getting all of their interests represented. The next sentence from comment eight highlights one of the main problems with conflicts of interests generally, and especially with material limitation conflicts. It says the mere possibility of subsequent harm does not in itself require disclosure and consent. Note that there's unclear lines here. Um, do you even need to ask the client for consent? Or is the hypothetical conflict too attenuated and theoretical um, to matter? Uh, you could think of this as a continuum or a spectrum of conflicts. At one extreme, there are situations where the conflict is so trivial or attenuated or theoretical that it's not even worth bringing up with the client. That means you don't even need to ask for consent in such a case. At the other end of the spectrum, there are situations where the conflict is so pronounced or intense that really it would not be reasonable for the lawyer to think that she could provide adequate representation um, or competent representation for at least one of the affected clients, and that makes that type of conflict non-consentable under Rule 1.7b1. And so in that case, you would have to decline the representation because even if the affected clients uh, consent in such extreme cases, and sometimes they do because they want to save money and share a lawyer, but the lawyer could be subject to discipline for proceeding. Most situations are somewhere in the middle something you should disclose to the affected clients. For example, opposing counsel is your best friend or someone you've been dating recently and ask for their consent in writing. 
and then you could proceed with the representation. Comment 8 continues, The critical questions are the likelihood that a difference in interest will eventuate. And, if it does, whether it will materially interfere with the lawyer's independent professional judgment in considering alternatives or foreclose courses of action that reasonably should be pursued on behalf of the client. That's the concern, is that uh, you won't bring certain options up because you don't want to offend the others, but if the client had, if each client had their own lawyer, that lawyer would have said, well, you could do this. Um, so you might uh, foreclose certain courses of action or um, not advocate for certain things. Here's an example. There's a couple of famous cases like this from estate planning. So there's a lawyer who um, agreed to draft a will for a couple, and th the lawyer learned just before the wills were uh, completed that the husband, unbeknownst to the wife, was actually also married to another person. And of course, that is relevant for estate planning. There's a similar famous case about a lawyer who agreed to draft wills for a married couple, but the husband later called the lawyer and told him privately that he had had an affair many years before, very briefly, but a child had resulted from that uh, union, and uh, he had never met this child, but guessed that the kid would be around 20 years old at that point. And in both of these cases, a husband did not want the lawyer to tell the wife about it. I hope you can see the problem for the lawyer. He can't betray the husband's confidence, but he also cannot withhold the information from the wife if she's a co-client in the estate planning. That would, it's, in other words, the representation of the wife is materially impaired. There's something very important that is relevant and for decision-making in the matter that she can't be told about. Um, the information is certainly significant for the representation. Another wife could be a potential heir, as could um, uh, a child. And the lawyer in this case, in either of these cases, would have to withdraw from the representation with as little explanation as possible, right? Because he can't betray the husband's confidence. So he'll just have to say something like, I cannot proceed with the representation because um, I have an ethical issue or a conflict of interest issue has arisen. Moving on to comment nine, it reminds us that lawyers have responsibilities to other parties. So one is former clients and also some people that are not even clients. So it begins, in addition to conflicts with current clients, the lawyer's duty of loyalty and independence may be materially limited by responsibilities to former clients under Rule 1.9. We'll get to that rule later. But the limited duties a lawyer has to former clients could foreclose handling certain matters for other clients in the future. That's all you need to know about 1.9 at this point in the course. If the matters are related or involve the overlapping confidential information. Another material limitation could be the fiduciary duties arising from a lawyer's service as a trustee or executor or even a corporate director or board member. A party with a fiduciary duty has a legal duty to put the other person's interest before their own. And um, so the lawyer would have to subordinate his personal interests or any other interests uh, to, those, uh, to those of the uh, trustees or the beneficiaries of the fiduciary duty. And so I hope you can see that that's a restraint on what options the lawyer would have in certain representations. If the lawyer is an executor or a trustee, he has fiduciary duties to the beneficiaries. Um, uh, board members of corporations have fiduciary duties to the shareholders and so forth. And those are legally binding duties on the lawyer that could foreclose certain positions to take in representing other clients. That wraps up our discussion of comment eight and um, material limitations. There's more to talk about though, in terms of material limitations, especially with the lawyer's personal conflicts of interest. And that will be the subject of my next lecture video.